Um, if you guys would, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, last couple of times I, I preached here in the, the building, it was the end of chapter 5, the beginning of chapter 6, and Pastor Dave asked me a couple of times to preach on the live stream while we weren't meeting, and that was through the rest of chapter 6. So we're going to be in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to start out in verse 2. Uh, we finished up with verse 1, which is kind of the end of a paragraph. So we're going to be at verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And you know, this morning, Dave asked us to stand as we read the word. And if uh, I, I like that, a lot of times when I've preached different places, I'll ask that. But, you know, I, I don't know what the norm is for the church. But if we could stand, that would be wonderful, I think. And I have to get my Bible turned there first. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're just going to read three verses, verses 2, 3, and 4. It says, Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying in you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulations. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you all for that. So, a lot of the times we hear the church talking about love, and we hear the world talking about love, and we see that they have a skewed view of what it is and what it means. And many times, those of us who believe the Bible, and those of us who trust the Bible, will want to drive over to the other ditch because the false teachers are talking about love in a skewed way, in a false way. So we want to, a lot of times, get out of talking about love. We want to talk about God's holiness, which we should. We want to talk about God's judgment, which we should. But part of his holiness, outpouring from his holiness, is his love. And we want to preach love rightly. We want to understand love rightly. And you notice in the passage that we read, love is not mentioned anywhere. But it's pouring out of every line in that set of scriptures. It just pours out the love that Paul has for the Corinthian church. So I want to first have you guys think of three things. Consider three things as we're going through this set of scriptures. Love does not lead to sin. Write them down if you want to. Gentry, I know you got room in your Bible to write them down, so write them down. Love does not lead to sin. Love unites, and love brings joy. That's pretty simple. Love does not lead to sin. Love unites, and love brings joy. So I want to read that first uh, little part again. Verse 2. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Love pours out of that. He's saying, hey, you know us. I've written letters to you before. You know me. I was there. I preached the gospel to you. You know me. These false brothers that are coming in and speaking ill of me and my partners here, you know what they're saying ain't true. You know that I love you, the Corinthian church, the church at Corinth. I love you. And I mean, that's an amazing thing to say. It's a wonderful thing to say. But the world and God have totally different views of what love is. According to God, you know, love starts with him, doesn't it? Yes. It always starts with him. He is love. That's what his word says, right? Yes. I'm going to turn and... I don't normally do a lot of turning. I may reference some other scriptures, but I want to read part of 1 John chapter 4 here, and we'll get right back over to 2 Corinthians. But 1 John chapter 4, I want to read a few verses, starting in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. 
He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believe that the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So we can see right there, I referenced it already, God is love. And what? We love him because he first loved us. Other versions, the ESV I know says, it doesn't even say him. It just says we love because he first loved us. Either way, either interpretation, either way that's translated, that's right. We don't love God and then he returns that to us. We don't love other people. We don't love anything except by the grace of God that he has given us the ability to love. Praise God for that. Amen. You know, love of God. We have love of God because he first loved us. Deuteronomy 6, 5. That, every Jew knows that by heart. It is you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your... I already messed it up myself. And, and it ends in uh, all your might. And then Jesus repeats that over in the New Testament. He was asked, hey, what is, your, what is the greatest commandment? He says to love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we're all in bad trouble, right? Because we ain't done either one of them. If the greatest commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor, then the greatest sin is to not love God and to not love your neighbor. And we have failed miserably at that. But ain't it great that we've got one who didn't fail at that, who took our place. He lived for us. Can you believe Jesus loved on our behalf? Not only does he love us, but he loved God on our behalf. He loved his parents, his earthly parents, on our behalf. He loved his disciples on our behalf. He loved his siblings on our behalf. Imagine that. I've got a sister. We didn't show love to each other all the time. I don't know about any of y'all with siblings. You probably didn't show love to each other all the time either, right? Can you imagine Jesus, the oldest brother of all the children, I'm sure they didn't show him perfect love all the time. I'm sure Mary and Joseph every once in a while said, James, why can't you be like Jesus? He's, he's always obedient. Man, I bet James hate, grew up hating Jesus. Until he was born again, he saw he's the Messiah. You know, Mary and Joseph, they weren't perfect. No matter what Rome says about Mary, Mary was not perfect. And, you know, how amazing would it be 
to be that son of parents who are sinners, and he perfectly obeyed those sinners his entire life. How wonderful. What love he has shown. And then to condescend down to us, to love us, the unlovable, his enemies. You know, these, these people in Corinth here, they should know a little bit something about love. What's the love chapter, guys? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So we're here in 2 Corinthians. So Paul is writing to them, showing his love, saying, hey, you know, you guys know these things. You guys know me. You know my love for you. I even wrote you a letter before. And people for 2,000 years have been saying this is the love chapter of the whole Bible. So surely you guys in that letter, you, you might have got a little something out of it, right? It's, it's amazing. And I won't read that for time's sake, but you guys read that later tonight. You probably know in the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, there's multiple words for love. Have y'all heard of agape love? Y'all heard that word before. Agape love. That ain't what most people think of when they think of love, though, is it? They think of two teenagers, you know, going on a date and maybe kissing in the movie theater. They think, oh, that, that's that Eros love. How many times do you think Eros love shows up in the New Testament? Absolutely none. But we, we will read 1 Corinthians 13, or we might read 1 John chapter 4, and we might have that idea of love in our heads. That it's that maybe a romantic love. At, at weddings all the time, 1 Corinthians 13 may be read as a scripture reading. That's a fine thing to do. A husband ought to have that agape love for his wife. A wife ought to have that agape love for her husband. But that Eros love, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, the world, when they see love, they think of lust usually, don't they? It's very common. You know, they think of, what can you do for me? How do you make me feel? Right? That's how the world thinks. How do you make me feel? I love you as long as you can make me feel good. Right? That's not godly love. God has emotions, but he is not emotive. He is not emotional. His love does not change. And that is the example that we should look at. And that is the reflection that we should show. Just like that hymn that we just sang. You know, let my life reflect the grace that I've been shown to others. Let that grace that I've been shown reflect to God, to my brothers and sisters, to the lost world that I have been changed that I have been loved so much when I didn't deserve it that I'm going to love others when they don't deserve it. And we never deserve it. But what can you do for me is the, is the motto of worldly love. You know, think, think of Christ. The love of Christ, that is true love. It's far superior to the false, up and down, emotional love of the world. You know, love does not lead to sin. But if you watch TV today and they're talking about love on there, it always leads to sin, don't it? Because it ain't agape love. It's that eros love. It's that emotional love. It's the, well, you did this to me. I'm going to get back at you. I'm not going to love you anymore. I'm glad God didn't say that to us. Praise God for that. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Paul is telling these Corinthians to look at who he is. Look at how they've known him. These false brethren, they've been coming in there. They've been talking trash about Paul. They wanting to gain followers. They're wanting to gain probably financially or however it is. They're wanting to drag Paul's name through the mud. But he's asking them. Paul's saying, guys, Corinthians, Look at the evidence. Look at me. Look at how I was when I was with you. Look at my first letter. 
Paul didn't wrong anybody. He didn't corrupt anybody. He didn't take advantage of anybody. What did he do? He preached the gospel to them. The most succinct description of the gospel in the New Testament was 1 Corinthians 15. Right? He gave them the gospel. The greatest news, the most loving thing that anybody ever could be given. That is love. Paul loved the Corinthians. And he shows it. He poured into them. It's like Pastor Dave here. He pours into us here. Every time he stands in the pulpit, he pours out the word of God. What more loving thing can we do? So many today think in evangelism, they think, oh, well, we don't want to offend people with the Bible, do we? So we're just going to say, Jesus loves you. We've watered down biblical love when we do that. Jesus loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And they'll say, well, that's just wonderful because I love me too. Me and him's going to get along real good because I love me and he loves me. And I've got great plans. And he's got great plans. How can it not work out perfectly? Real love is a giving love. Real love is telling somebody the truth. Real love, what? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. It's a giving love. Same thing in, in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, these guys, they knew God's love toward us wicked sinners, that it's not a love by the world standards that's up and down, up and down. You know, like Pastor David preached in Hebrews. You know, a lot of these were Hebrew believers who they, they were kind of wanting to go back to the old way. They wanted to go back to the old way. They think, oh, you know, we want to go back to the way it was under the old covenant. But no, in, in Hebrews... It's constantly over and over again. No, Jesus is a lot better. That's what Pastor Dave was talking about. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the old covenant. Jesus is better than Abraham. Jesus is better than David. Jesus is better. Amen. And that's the same thing Paul is, is going through. He's saying no. Jesus is the best thing. He's what I've given you. He's what I've proclaimed to you. God has gained nothing in loving us. We're not lovable. There's nothing lovable about us except what he puts in us in his Holy Spirit. It's not a selfish love from God because God has everything. When you have everything, you gain nothing. God has never gained a single thing. But he has given so much. He gave his only son for us, wicked sinners. He gave his son for us. He gains nothing by loving us. Because we offer him nothing. It's been said, I don't remember who said this, but you know, I contribute nothing to my salvation except for the sin that made it necessary. I don't remember who said that, but it's the absolute truth. I contribute nothing to God. He gives all to me, though. He gave his son for me. Hey, do you realize you've been shown that ultimate love? Sometimes we can get bogged down in life, and we think, Man, God, God's just forgot about me. God's not thinking about me. God doesn't love me anymore. No. He loves us unchangingly. No matter what sin I commit, no matter what way I disobey him no matter what trial I'm going through no matter how I see it his love for me doesn't change what a comfort that is lost world don't see it that way Amen. you know God's love far exceeds any kind of earthly love any worldly love and we should be motivated to reciprocate that love to other Christians first and then to the lost world second that is how we show that we are born again. They will know us by our what? Our love for one another, which is a fruit of being born again. 
they will know us by our love for each other. Second point, love unites. Let's read verse 3. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. You know, if you look back at uh, ver- chapter 6, verse 11, he's talking about our hearts are open to you. Our hearts are enlarged, it says in the King James. But our hearts are wide open. And he says what? Right here in verse 3. Is that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. The New American Standard translates that. I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. You are in our hearts. They are knit together. We are what one body right we have many members but we're one body Paul is just pouring that out here he's showing his love his heart's open his heart's enlarged he says to say we are together in this to live together to die together we are in this together as one body as believers whether it's the body of believers here at Bass Chapel or the next body of believers down the road, or a body of believers on the other side of the globe, we are one body. Christ is the head, we are one body. Paul makes it clear here, and he's defending himself. He's saying, hey, you know, back in verse 2, we didn't do this, we didn't do that, we're not doing these things. And he says right here, hey, but don't take this as us attacking you. He says, I speak not this to condemn you, He's saying, hey, I love you guys. We are all part of one body. By me defending myself, I'm not attacking you. That, and that, a lot of times we can get that way, can't we? Yeah. I know I can. Uh, a lot of times, you know, somebody's maybe given an explanation for what they did. My sinful brain can maybe hear it as, oh, they digging on me that's my wickedness coming out but no he's he's making it clear no I'm not doing this to attack you I'm just restoring my reputation I'm pointing out to you guys that you know who I am and that you know that I am bringing you the truth and the truth is a hard thing to deliver to people sometimes it it is but he makes it clear that they're brothers. Whether they're in Corinth or whether in Ephesus or wherever, that they're one body. They are united in Christ. We are united to Paul. Ain't that great to think that we are part of the same body? Christ the head, Paul, Peter, John, and all of them. They're all part of the same body that we are here today. And whether it was, you know, Augustine in the the 4th century or whether it was Martin Luther in the 16th century, we're all believers. We're all part of that same body throughout all of church history. You know, Paul's still speaking of the things that the Corinthians should know. They're united together as one body. We just referenced 1 Corinthians 13. Well, you back up one chapter from that, you got 1 Corinthians 12. And it says what? Does the eye not have a need for an ear? Or what about the smelling? You know, every member is important. Every member of the body is important. Corinthians, whether you're a pinky toe or whether you're the heart, you're important. He's making it clear that we are all needed. Here he's emphasizing, you know, not just the usefulness of an eye or an ear or a nose but the necessity that all are joined to one body if my heart's dead is my eye alive no way if my liver is dead is my thumb alive no any part of me is dead the whole thing's dead and that's the way it is he's letting them know that Ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. He just, he's pouring it out. 
that whether his brother aches, he aches. That happens for us, don't it? A lot of times, we'll hear a prayer request for a Christian that we have never met before, but we'll ache for that brother. You know, we'll hear the persecuted church. We'll hear, you know, a pastor in Iran or a pastor in North Korea getting tortured. And that makes us ache just in our guts because that's our brother. You know, the world doesn't understand that unity. The world doesn't even think of that most of the time. You know, we all know lost people, and they may say, oh, well, that's terrible. Or they got a family member or a close friend, and it really destroys them when, when something bad happens to them. And that's, that's a little bit of common grace, that God has shown them a little bit of grace, that they actually have some kind of empathy there. But in themselves and in ourselves, apart from being born again into a new body, we don't have the, even that little bit of sympathy toward anyone. And especially the lost world looks at us like we're crazy. It's like, you know, those Chinese brothers over there are getting persecuted, and it's, it's a big deal to us. And the lost world are like, that's over in China, big deal. No, that's my brother. That's my, that's my liver. I'm a kidney. He's a liver. It hurts. You stub your toe, your head's hurting sometimes. You get a headache. You get a headache, you start getting a backache. Right? You get sick to your stomach. What happens? You get a headache. Everything hurts. When one thing hurts. <clears throat> Love brings joy. Let's read verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory, glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joy, joyful in all our tribulations joy love real love real godly love brings so much joy uh, we talked about it earlier that worldly type of love it'll bring joy or happiness for a little while joy is steady state joy is a straight line that is given from god happiness goes up and down don't it worldly love would get real happy and then Somebody disappoints us and we get down here. And then they do something nice, we get way up high again, and then they disappoint us and we go down again. That's that world. Godly love, that agape love is steady state. Once he has poured it out on us, it stays the same all the time. And the joy that we receive from that should be constant all the time. We're not always happy, but we're, we should always be joyful in that you can just hear the love in Paul's voice it's just leaping off the page here he proclaims his great love for the Corinthians he's bragged on the Corinthians he's boasted about them he's comforted by his relationship to them he's bursting with joy through his relationship with his brothers and sisters in the Corinthian church even through all the headaches that we have read so far in 2 Corinthians, and even back into 1 Corinthians, that they have given Paul. What's he saying here? He's saying, I'm bursting with joy. All the times he's had to correct them and say, hey, you know, remember back to 1 Corinthians, you know, the guy who was sleeping with his stepmother, even through that, he's like, I'm exceeding in joy because of you, because you're my brother's. Because you're my sister, sisters. All of this through affliction, through tribulation. We don't want to miss that last word in verse 4. Through tribulation in the King James. Through affliction is what the New American Standard says. Through all these pains, he is full of joy. Why? Because of God. It all comes from God. He can be joyful. He can be bursting with joy. Even through the headaches, we do that too. I don't know if anybody's ever had their 
child give them a headache before. Not me. My children are perfect in every way. <laughs> but we have joy in our children even when they're given as grief. And I've never had a fight with my wife, but I imagine if we, if we would have ever had a fight, that even though I might have a little grief in that, that I'm still full of joy because of her. That's the way we should be with each other, too. I can be a royal jerk sometimes, much of the time. When I am leaning on my flesh, I can be a smart aleck. I can be all those terrible sinful things. But because of our relationship in Christ, we can overlook those things. We can find, I hope sometimes y'all can find joy in me despite those sins. As Paul found joy in the Corinthians despite their sins. We have confidence in each other. Just like Paul's talking about, I have confidence in you, Corinthians. I have confidence in my brothers and sisters in Christ. We can sometimes get on each other's nerves. I can sometimes be harsh with my kids. I can be harsh with my wife. But we have confidence in each other because of an agape love, not an emotional love. Because of the God of God and the love that he's given us. Even in pain, Paul's full of joy because of these believers. <clears throat> Are we loving with that godly love, that agape love? Are we? You know, the world views it, I'll love you as long as you're fulfilling a need in me. I'll love you as long as you're making me happy. What does the world do when things go bad? The world hits the road. The world abandons those they say they loved. Soon as things get rocky, soon as things get rough, agape love stays the course. Agape love, God's love that he has put in us as believers, it stays steady. It keeps us steady. When we've been forgiven so much, how can we not forgive the little sins that those who were knit together by God into one body, how can we not forgive those? We don't have an excuse not to forgive. We don't have an excuse not to love. We've been loved so much. The world views love totally different. I love somebody because of how they make me feel or what they can do for me. That ain't love. That's manipulation. That's not love. That's an emotional roller coaster. Are we loving with that godly love? The love that motivated the Father to send the Son to die in our place? To die in the place of sinners who were enemies? We were enemies until God made us new creations. Until he reconciled us back to himself. Until he made us born again. Until he regenerated us. Repentance toward God is love. But it's only reflected because he, enabled us, he enables us. Amen. Faith towards God is love. But only because he enables us. The one spirit that indwells everyone who believes, it knits us together in this reconciliation. The seal of the Holy Spirit is what draws us together. It's what enables us to forgive each other. It's what enables us to love one another. It's what enables us to coexist. You see those coexist bumper stickers? That ain't coexisting. Every one of those things is against every other one. The cross 
is the only thing in which people can coexist. Only the cross. Every other one of those symbols on that coexist bumper sticker, they're going to coexist in hell one day. That's right. But that cross, only those who are born again through the cross, through the blood of Christ, will coexist here in harmony, here in love, here in forgiveness, and for eternity in perfection. How wonderful is that? Now, have you failed to love with that agape love? You don't have to answer that because the answer is yes, we all have. We have all failed. Of course you have failed. We all have. But the good news is that the advocate with the Father, the Son, we have a representative who is standing in our place, loved perfectly with that agape love every day of his earthly residence. And throughout all of eternity, think about this. We can say God is love because he is always loved. Who was there to love before he created anything? There was himself. The triune God, the Father, loved the Spirit and the Son. The Son loved the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit loved the Father and the Son. It's that relationship within the Godhead himself that shows that he is love because he is love for all of eternity past, all of eternity future. Before he created the first thing, he was able to love because of the Trinity, because of the triune nature of God. He loved himself before the foundation of the world. That relationship that has always been perfect. He loves today. He has redeemed us. He loves his beloved bride, us whom he's purchased with his own blood. Do you know him? Do you know Christ as that loving God? The one who loves righteousness. He loves righteousness and justice so much that he can't turn a blind eye to sin. A lot of people want to twist that today. Well, God's loving. He's just going to forgive everybody, sweep everything under the rug, and let everybody into heaven. No, that's not a loving God because that means sin is not punished. The loving God has to punish sin. The loving God punished sin on His Son for all who will trust in Him. Christian, are you resting in that finished work of Christ today or are you beating yourself up over every time you fail to love? We can rest. Let's look ten times at Christ before we look once at ourselves. Let's look at His righteousness over and over and over and over again before we look at the wickedness in us. And then that when we see that evil in us, we can appreciate the righteousness in Him all the more. Are you resting? Are you resting in His perfect agape love? Are you resting in the Lord Jesus? Let's pray. Father, You are so good. You are so loving. We can't praise you enough for how you sent your son to take our punishment, to live the righteous life that we couldn't live. You are so wonderful. Thank you for that agape love that you've shown us. Thank you that you so love the world that you sent your only begotten son. Whoever believes in him won't perish but will have everlasting life. We praise you for this book that you've given us that shows of your love and it shows of your holiness and your righteousness. shows of your judgment. It shows us how all those things work together in unity. It shows us that you don't contradict yourself. It shows us your character, Lord. I ask that you would be with us and grow us in your Holy Spirit. May you affect us. May you affect us daily through your word. May you just help us endure. Endure this sinful world as we have our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen.